Hey folks, Quill18 here, and welcome to a special Fallout 4 video where we take a tour of famous Boston landmarks. These are going to be landmarks that exist in the real city of real Boston that also exist here in the, um, the fictional version of Boston in the Commonwealth of Fallout 4. Now, of course, Boston in Fallout 4 is massively compressed. As a result, the landmarks are a bit closer together, um, and they tend to be a lot smaller as well. But it's still really interesting, I think, to do it. As someone, um, I've, I've gone to PAX East, which was in Boston, and I stayed for an extra couple of days, and I played tourist uh, with Essentia with my wife, and we went all over. And it was really amazing to discover the same sorts of things in this fictionalized version of Boston. I found it really, really exciting. In particular, and note, there. I will try to avoid any sort of plot spoilers in this video um, and try to keep all sort of incidental spoilers to a minimum, although obviously there'll be some like map slash location spoilers if you're you know interested in that. Um, there is one sort of incidental thing, uh, a sort of a breadcrumb that kind of leads you to a faction that is going to be spoiled in this video. Um, so if you're really allergic to all spoilers, first of all, don't even click on any video that says Fallout in the name. What's wrong with you for crying out loud? Um, but yeah, this this should be, there's a minor spoiler about sort of one of the breadcrumbs that leads you to one of the factions in the game. But um, other than that, there, we should try to keep it pretty light. And the, so the thing is, the thing that was the spoiler was this. I was walking around and I ran into this red line on the sidewalk. And I'm like, I know what this is. This is the Freedom Trail. In Boston, there are there's this, this red line that you can follow along the sidewalk and it leads you to all these, um, across all these landmarks related to, well, the Freedom Trail. So the sense was, um, the theme is sort of like the War of Independence, that sort of freedom. Although not everything is directly related to that. It's just, you know, Boston is very, very much about that, that history of uh, the War of Independence. So we're going to start things off at Boston Commons. Boston Common is a, yeah, common, no S, no S, Boston Common is so named because it was a common piece of land. It was 50 acres assigned in the middle of the city that anyone could come and graze their cattle on here. And so you could feed your cattle um, on this property. And again, it's 50 acres large in real life. It is quite big. And these days it is a lovely, lovely park to walk in. Just absolutely gorgeous, really wonderful thing. Directly, hey dog meat, what'd you find? What you got, buddy? You got radiation is what you got. Oh my god, I totally missed this magazine the first time through. Dude, okay, let's get the hell out of those rads. Whoop, hoo, hoo. Um, what was I saying? Oh yes, directly adjacent to Boston Common and feeling very much like the same sort of structure these days. Um, you got this giant sort of Boston Common Park and then right next to it, you have the Public Garden. And, and literally here in Fallout, it's sort of the same piece of land, and it's really the, the garden don't actually show up as their own marker on the map, although I think it's called Swan's Pond, uh, which you can see, it's got a swan boat. That's the only reason that this place is called Swan's Pond. Um, absolutely nothing else going on here. I definitely recommend that you try to get as close to these waters as possible. Um, it's just, uh, there's, you, you get the yeah, look, blood leaf, this is why. you got to get as close as possible to this, lake, this water as possible. Um, but you've got these swan, and indeed the public garden does have these swan boats. It's very, very famous for it. And it's mostly during the summer you can go and get on these boats and get a nice leisure little thing through the, the ponds and tiny little sort of canals and waterways that, um, that, that connect the garden up. Really, 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 really quite lovely. So if we go and backtrack to wherever the hell we came in... Oh directly opposite of where I am now. We're getting a few more rads over here from these barrels. Tick, 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 tick. Okay, directly opposite here with this fountain is the start of the Freedom Trail. Also, there's a robot there that'll give you some history, which is interesting. So it starts here and you got these little plaques and then they've got this red trail. So we're gonna go and follow this red trail over here. Also, I believe this is the Park Street station. We're coming up on Park Street over here. This is a subway station that, as far as I know, exists actually in real life as well, which is nice. We're going to come check out this church in a moment. We're going to follow this red line up the hill over here. Bum, 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 bum. And what we have here is the State House. Actually, does that plaque? We can actually read it. Look at this. The quote-unquote new State House was completed in 1798 to house the government of the state of Massachusetts. The land selected was originally one of John Hancock's cow pastures. The original dome was constructed of wooden shingles and covered in copper smelted by Paul Revere. Paul Revere had a foundry. That was his profession. He was a like a metalsmith. Copper and silver, I believe. Maybe other things. I don't know. The state government used this building continuously until the formation of the 13 Commonwealths 
in 1969. I believe that last part is part of the fictionalized Fallout 4 universe. Anything after 1945 tends to diverge over here. Um, but we do have this state house. So this is the new state house, and keep that in mind, because soon in our tour, we're actually going to run into the old state house. But there's the dome at the top there, right here, that used to be covered in shingles, and then was replaced with copper um, sheeting from Paul Revere's foundry. Very exciting. So, we're going to continue down the trail, and we go right back down this hill over there. In, in reality, this, this street is a little bit longer, um, and it is actually feels like, you know, a good walk going up there. And then you're like, I have to go right back down it? Well, that felt pointless, but there we go. It is the path. Next thing on our tour is the, I believe it's just called the Park Street Church. I have my guidebook over here. Uh, the Park Street Church, indeed, is a church. And it's very awesome. We cannot enter it in this game as far as I know. But what's notable is that next to it here in the game is a feral ghoul. There we go. And I am level 35 at this point, and I've got some pretty heavily modded guns. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but in Fallout 4, um, areas do respawn monsters. I mean, which honestly I think is more realistic because um, what happens is. Like, it makes sense that there's lots of bad people. If you clear some out, well, other people are going to move back in. It does take a few days of in-game time to do it, but people will move back in. Anyway, we are now in, unless I'm mistaken, this should be the the granary graveyard, what's it called? The granary burying ground, or burial ground over here, um, which I don't think is literally right next to the church in real life. I don't know, maybe it's hard to tell because it's actually much bigger in real life, I think. I might be wrong about this. I might be getting confused with another graveyard I visited. In fact... Yeah, I am, actually. But, let it. Franklin's Grave. Check it out. Very cool. Looks like that in real life. Very awesome. There we go. Actual thing. And another one of these little marker bits. And we can keep following the line. Now, at this point, it will get a little bit more difficult to follow this line because there is a lot of debris along the way. And there's also a very good chance that we will indeed run into some super mutants very soon here. Um, and then, I'm not sure. We have to look around because... A lot of the other locations will not actually get marked here in Fallout. They did skip a few more things that you can find. Um, looks like the route goes this way. And there's a super mutant. There we are. It's probably more chasing me. Okay, then we end up here. Mm, I don't see another landmark there. There we go. Here is one. And it's got a plaque down there, and it's got one listed there. So this is the old state house, built in 1713. The old state house is the oldest public building in Boston. During the years before the Revolutionary War, this building was a hotbed for the ideas and ideals that would result in the revolution. It is here that John Adams said the child independence was born. In 1770, right outside its doors, the Boston Massacre took place, where five American colonists died inciting rage against the British occupation. The old state house was the seat of the Massachusetts government until the new state house was constructed in 1798. And I'm trying to remember which side of the state house the, um, the massacre happened. The layout's a little bit different than in real life. I think this is the wrong side. I think this is the back side from where it happened based on, on this. I think the side that had the, uh, the massacre has a little balcony on it, so we'll see if we can see it from the other side. I think we might loop around. I'm not sure. I mean, we could probably po poke through Good Neighbor there and see what we can get, but for now, let's just continue on the trail. And we definitely uh, missed a couple of things. We missed uh, the King's Chapel, which we would have seen along the way. Um, the Latin School, which is quite interesting. It was the first public Latin or grammar school in America. And, oh, the old corner bookstore. We, hold on. No, we didn't miss it. I would have I noticed it. Wouldn't I? Hang on, I can't miss that. Can't miss that. It's not this. Hmm. Well, hopefully I didn't miss it, and hopefully if we just continue down the trail, we will find it. Let's cross our fingers. I love the old corner booster. It actually might be on this corner over here. Let's see. I believe we're still following trail, although again, it's covered in debris. Okay, I originally should be using more vats. Good boy, dog meat. Also, I shouldn't be using this gun at close range. It's not really what it's meant for. Okay, there's a trail. There's the old corner bookstore. Excellent. Excellent. 
Okay, so this is actually a really boring location in uh, Fallout. It There's not a whole lot going on in there. I mean, you should still go in and see what you can find. Um, but it's not terribly exciting. Unfortunately, it's also not terribly exciting in real life. So, the old corner bookstore, and that's literally its name. Like, you see this and you're like, okay, that's just generic sort of, you know, Bethesda, I named a random building the old corner bookstore. But no, that's literally what it's referred to over here. It was originally built, let's turn on our light, as an apothecary after the devastating fire of, or great fire of 1711. Originally, the land belonged to Anne Hutchinson, the controversial Puritan who was excommunicated and banished from Massachusetts for her heretical beliefs and sermons. During the mid-19th century, the Old Corner Bookstore was the home of the leading American publisher Ticknor and Fields. They published the works of such luminaries as Charles Dickens, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry Wadsworth uh, Longfellow, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and Henry Dave Thoreau. Many of these were frequent visitors to this site. In um, current modern-day Boston, uh, the building is still there, and I believe it's a Chipotle, which is more than a little bit disappointing. Um, I'm pretty sure that is the case, though. Um, and it's a, it's a little bit heartbreaking, but hey, at least it's still physically there. All right, let's continue to follow the trail. And I believe that's going to be Faneuil Hall up ahead. Um, spoiler about enemies you're going to face here. There's going to be super mutant suiciders. Um, they may not have respawned, but I suspect that they probably will have. Um, so it's, it's a shame to sort of spoil that. Oh god, they weren't even here. I probably didn't even need to spoil it. But I wanted to give that pause. Oh, no, there, there are some super mutants. I want to give that verbal, like, that, that brief pause that there was a little tiny spoiler coming up. Anyway, if, uh, if you're mean, if you're feeling mean, um, make sure that you're... Um, that any friends you have come here and that you're watching the reaction. And we might not get any suiciders this time, but they are super, super fun to run into. In any case, the fact that there are um, super mutants at all. Anyway, we can read this, and we are, however, on fire, though. Can I read it with this? Faneuil Hall, donated to the city of Boston in 1742 by French merchant Pierre Faneuil. Faneuil Hall was a commercial hub in colonial Massachusetts. It also played a notable role in the American Revolution. Protests against the British Sugar and Stamps Acts began here and led to the doctrine of no taxation without representation. Later meetings were held here, which culminated in the Boston Tea Party. Many of the founding fathers met here or gave speeches here, notably Samuel Adams, leading to the building's nickname, the Cradle of Liberty. And you can definitely visit this. Um, unless I'm wrong, there is uh, quite a bit of uh, shopping, a bit of uh, markets and such that uh, happen around here. And anyway, it's a cool, very big, impressive building. And, oh, I never unlocked that door. I feel like I should go and do that right now just for experience points, if nothing else. No suiciders around here. That is very, very, very disappointing. Always, always good. Always a good time. Um... I wonder, if we went this way, would we be able to see the backside of the old state building? Wow, radarific. Hang on. Aid. Let's get um, a rat away and a rat X going on. Also, I can never hit these bugs. Apparently, I can't hit them in vats either. Seriously? Awesome. I don't like shooting from the hip, but... Actually zooming in on these bugs, that's a challenge. There we go. Thank you. Radiation. All these barrels. Um, yeah, I don't know. Wouldn't surprise me if we could see them from inside of um, Good Neighbor. Anywho, let's continue down the Freedom Trail at this point. You can already see something on the map, although it's in a slightly different position. There. Oh, yeah, that is going to be a spoiler. Ooh, okay, there is something related to the USS Constitution. I shouldn't have finished that. What am I doing? I need the purified water for crafting. Anyway, um, that will be moderately spoiled by our travels here. But, Freedom Trail continues down this way. I think this is a thing. Let me check my book here. It's not, it's not like, um, highlighted. One thing that we don't see on our tour, at least it's not explicitly brought out, and if you guys uh, know otherwise and you know where I can find it, it would be nice, uh, is Paul Revere House. If we keep walking here, we should run into Paul Revere House. Although, is Paul Revere House perhaps 
in Charleston. Charlestown? I don't remember if it's Charleston or Charlestown. Um, where Bunker Hill is and the original site of the, uh, the Constitution. The USS Constitution can be found here in both real life, I think it's around here, and in Fallout 4 unless you do some things with some quests. Uh, so yeah, I don't know about Paul Revere House. I mean, we walked there, but I know it was a fair bit of a hike. Like, between, you know, the, say, Faneuil Hall and Paul Revere hu uh, House was a hell of a walk. I'm not sure. I might be wrong now. Maybe Paul Revere House is somewhere along the way, but we definitely... I don't think are we going to encounter... Is it possible that it was this? There's a lantern. That's kind of telling. I wonder if this was supposed to be it. Again, I don't think it's in the game. Hmm. I'm not sure. There's the back of Faneuil Hall. And with the statue of Paul Revere, for example. Oh, which is where the path goes. Right, it curves away. All right. Oh, wait, that's not Faneuil Hall. That's the Old North Church, which has the statue of Paul Revere, because Old North Church is the one that was the one if by land, two if by sea thing. Right? The lanterns over here, or the other way around, I don't remember. One if by sea, two if by land? No, that doesn't sound right at all. But this is the site where that happened. This is the, the place where the window was where they put the lantern in there. And if you go there in real life, you'll get some cool story about how difficult it was and how risky it was and all those things. We do get a plaque here. Built in 1723, the Old Norse Church is the oldest standing church in Boston. Its 191-foot tall steeple also makes it the tallest church in Boston. On the night of April 18th, 1775, Lieutenant Colonel Smith marched with 700 British soldiers to Concord on a mission to disarm the rebels. Using a plan devised by Paul Revere, uh, Robert Newman climbed to the top of this church and lit two lanterns, two lanterns, uh, alerting patriots that the Redcoats were coming up the Charles River, thus inspiring Longfellow's famous verse, one if by land, two if by sea, there you go. Uh, the battles of Lexington and Concord that followed would start the American Revolution. So this is the end of the Freedom Trail in-game over here, but in practice, the Freedom Trail, I, I don't know if the red markers keep going, although I think they do, do continue uh, across um, to, I think this is Charlestown, is that how it pronounce? It's not Charleston, right? It's Charlestown. Um, and we are going to go there. In fact, we're going to take a shortcut and go directly to Bunker Hill over here. And welcome to Bunker Hill. One of my favorite things about Bunker Hill here is that, um, so this structure, obelisk, spire, tower, I don't know what you'd call this thing. Um, it, it is very impressive in real life. It is, it is absolutely monstrously huge. Uh, very, 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 very cool. Um, it, it, and it's on top of the hill, obviously, Bunker Hill. It uh, commemorates a battle uh, of the sort of uh, American patriots or revolutionaries versus the British that um, didn't happen here on Bunker Hill. And the Americans lost. The, the bulk of the fighting happened on a nearby other hill called Breed's Hill, not Bunker Hill over here, although there may have been some tiny, tiny skirmishing. Um, and I, I've heard a few different stories and a few different explanations as to, um, as to whether, you know, was it people getting confused here? There were definitely defenses and everything set up here, but there wasn't really much in the way of attack. The idea was to try to defend a cache of weapons. Obviously, if you're going to run a revolution, you need some weapons, and uh, they were going to try to defend it, but... Um, something about the wrong hill. You guys can Wikipedia the uh, the story to get it a little bit more accurately there, but there is there is something kind of humorous about that. I think that the whole monument exists on a hill, on the sort of on the wrong hill, and that the Americans also did lose. Um, you can go into it in real life, although I wasn't able to. I think it was. I think we got there too late, or maybe it was outside of the right season. Uh, but you can enter it both in game and in real life. And actually, in game, minor item spoiler. Uh, apparently, I'd never come up here before. There is a magazine that you can pick up that gives you 25% more XP whenever you persuade someone of the opposite gender. I am playing as a female character, so we've got that. Um, my character doesn't steal things, so as much as it is tempting to, well, I very rarely steal things. So as much as it's very tempting to grab that flip lighter for its oil. By the way, that glow. Um, that glow is because I have, um, I believe it's Scrapper level 2. Come on, click. There we go. Where's the Scrapper? Right over here. Um, items with favorited components are highlighted. So that's, I have Scrapper level 2, and if you look at my, say, junk over here, 
I don't have any for a good example. Um, component view. What you can do for any component is you can tag something. Let's say like I need a lot of fiberglass. So from this view, you can Q to tag for search. Also, if you're ever crafting and you don't have enough of a component to finish to, to craft something, you can tag whatever it is you're trying to build. And what it will do, like the key for the tag, what it will do is it'll put that little magnifying glass to all the bits you're missing. Okay, and what's nice about that is if I go back to my normal item view, anything with the tag stuff, like I've tagged fiberglass, anything with tagged fiberglass will show up with a little magnifying glass there to like point out like, hey, if you run out of um, inventory space, you probably don't want to drop this thing because, you know, this is something that you need. Not only that, if you do have scrapper level two, then again, stuff in the world that contains it. So I have oil tagged, for example, so this is glowing because this flip lighter contains oil. But I don't like to steal things uh, with this character. It's just not the way that I play her. So I did take the bullets, though, because that was not marked as owned. Now, I would like very much to look out these windows and show you some cool sights. Uh, but unfortunately, there is something somewhat spoilerific if I were to do that. Um, not main plot spoiler, but awesome plot spoiler. And for the very f same reason, I am not going to go and show you the USS Constitution on this particular run. Um, just because it is one of my absolute favorite... Hello. Oh, inaccessible. Hmm. Um, it is one of my favorite, favorite sort of side missions in the entirety of Fallout 4. I'm also a big fan of Vault 81. Vault 81, again, no main spot, plot spoilers whatsoever. Um, just, it's... Uh, it's it has nothing to do with the main plot. It is like a, a side thing. I mean, maybe there's some stuff that's involved in the main plot, uh, but generally speaking, it's just completely disconnected. Uh, you can you can sort of run into uh, to Vault 81 accidentally, which is what I did. Or um, I think in um, Diamond City, oh, see these things are all glowing because I think I also tagged Acid. I'm not sure. Um, in Diamond City, I think if you hang out in a bar or something, you might hear uh, a random conversation that will. Um, put the location of Vault 81 on the map. Very worth checking out, but the USS Constitution is highly worth checking out. Um, no, I can't, I can't open the map at this point. It would, it would spoil a little something something. Um, but, so, USS Constitution, just like Bunker Hill, is in Charleston. Uh, or Charlestown. I think it's pronounced Charlestown, uh, which is north of Boston proper, just across a river. And the Constitution is on the east side of it. Um, you'll be able to see the little ship icon on your radar, for example. And you should definitely check it out. USS Constitution, very interesting history there. Um, it was built, um, I think it was... It was launched in 1787, there you go, but it's, uh, it got a lot of its reputation for doing awesome stuff during the War of 1812. The War of 1812 was technically a war against an independent, it was an independent United States of America versus Great Britain, right? This was after the War of Independence, and it was, it was an interesting war. I mean, in Canada, we like to talk about the War of 1812 because it's the one where Canadians went and burned down the White House. Um... Of course, Canada didn't really exist at the time, uh, but it did actually. They, uh, I've heard it said that the War of 1812 had three winners. Canada won because it actually helped to cement a bit of a national identity. And Canada had been existing, you know, or the colonies of Upper and Lower Canada or whatever it was, because again, it wasn't an actual country quite yet. Um, they were really worried, the Canadians at the time, that about being invaded by America. And, you know, just being swallowed up by this very rapidly growing U.S. of A. And that showed that Canadians could you know, hold the line over there and not worried about being conquered by uh, the U.S. That's one of the reasons our capital is not, say, in Toronto, for example. It's considered to be far too close to the American border. And instead, it's uh, up in Ottawa, which is, you know, a few hundred kilometers from the closest point of the American border. Um, and, and so that was one of the things. It was literally like fear of being invaded by, by America. But... Canada considered that to be a big win. Meanwhile, America considered it to be a big win because they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the biggest power in the world, Great Britain at the time, and in particular the biggest naval power, and survived and, you know, held their own. Sure, it didn't really make any gains, um, but, you know, they declared, I think America declared war, and, you know, didn't, didn't get their butt kicked, and that was considered to be a big win. And there was also a big win at the Battle of New Orleans, I think, even though, if I recall correctly, technically the Battle of New Orleans happened after the declaration of peace because it took so long to get messages by whatever like the peace treaty or the ceasefire or whatever were signed it was after it a few days after that the battle of new orleans happened um just because you know 
people hadn't found out yet. So it's still a legit battle as part of the war, though. Um, and so America's considered that a win. And meanwhile, um, Great Britain also kind of considered it to be a win because at the time they were busy fighting, I don't know, some Napoleon dude or something like that. And that was diverting a lot of their attention. And then meanwhile, they got another big war declaration from what used to be like their biggest goddamn colony in the universe. I mean, that was a lot of land. And um, they had to worry about defending Canada and doing these things. And in the end, they didn't really lose anything there either. So... Everyone won, except apparently the Native Americans who just got completely boned in the deal. Um, so there you go. Three winners and one bad, bad, bad loser. Um, so sucks. To, as always, sucks to be them. They just got boned over and over and over. Anyway, uh, the Constitution, which is where this all started with, uh, was most famous for her action during the War of 1812. She's considered a heavy frigate. So a frigate is not a ship of the line. A ship of the line, um, like the really big, big, big ships, would literally like form a line, you know, one behind the other, and then everyone would basically have their broadsides, all their cannons turned towards the enemy, and they'd form these big, giant lines. Frigates weren't heavy enough to be able to withstand the kind of uh, fire from a proper, um, I don't know what you would call it, like a proper big-ass warship, and a ship of the line, whatever that class would be referred to. Um, but was, because the United States didn't really have a navy at all yet, uh, the, I think the six ships that were being built at the same time as the Constitution were built up to sort of be the capital ships of the new U.S. Navy, which didn't really exist. And so they're actually, they were heavier than your standard frigates. They were heavy frigates. And um, so, and they, they saw a lot of action. They actually saw a lot of action against the French off the Barbary Coast, which was a very famous thing. And one of the things is the Constitution got, like, re revamped multiple times. It was in action for, like, really hardcore for at least, like, a hundred years, doing doing a lot of work, and then, you know, going back in the dry dock for a while, then finally getting renovated and updated and retrofitted, and then going back out and doing some more work again and again and again. And what's notable about the USS Constitution, even though it was launched in 1797, it is still technically an active ship in the U.S. Navy. If you go to visit in real life, you will be going onto a naval base and you will be uh, subject to, you know, security checkpoints and everything as if you were going on a military base because that's exactly what you're doing. It is open to the public for visit, although, again, just like with the uh, Bunker Hill th thing over here, when I went uh, there, uh, I wasn't able to go on. I don't remember if it was, again, after hours. I don't think so, though, because I was able to go into the uh, nearby museum. I think... Instead, they may have been... Well, they weren't starting the renovation yet, because apparently that's going on now. They're doing another big renovation revamp. But maybe, I don't know, it was closed for something. Maybe maybe it was just that day, maybe it was on a Sunday or some damn thing, I don't know. Um, but whatever reason, I couldn't actually go on the ship, which was very, very heartbreaking. Um, I was really, really sad about that. But uh, there is a cool museum nearby as well that was definitely worth checking out, but I'll have to go back. One of the interesting things is because of all the, the renovations that they'd done, and again, maybe they were in the middle of some renovations at the time, um, knock some stuff around, uh, there was, in the gift shop, you were able to buy some bits of wood that were actually part of the Constitution at some point and were, you know, like, taken off because the boards, you know, were getting a bit old and weren't holding water, I presumably, and were having to be replaced. But they took those old bits of wood and they um, they, they broke it up and they were selling bits of it in the gift shop. So I was able to bring that home. Uh, and we gave it to A Kiss for Luck, who was very into uh, the history of the Constitution. So she thought that was cool. And I thought that was cool. Just like when I went to Berlin, we got a chunk of the Berlin Wall. You know, touristy sort of thing. But at the same time, God, that's badass. Anyway, that concludes our tour of... Um, of Boston here, obviously there are a few other uh, landmarks to talk about. We could talk about Diamond City, but of course most people have gotten there at this point, so we don't really need to tell you much about it. And if you haven't gotten there, I don't want to spoil what Diamond City is, because that would just be that would just be mean and wrong. So that concludes this video. Hope you enjoyed it. And if you actually have any other landmarks that um, should be brought up, let me know. I'm going to open the map at this point, which does have, obviously, location spoilers. Also, um, may have a minor spoiler about the USS Constitution stuff. So, um, if you want to turn off the video now, that is totally fine. And I appreciate you stopping by. Otherwise, I'm going to open that up, and we're going to take a quick scan of the map, see if I can think of anything else. All right. So, I mean, obviously, in the, uh, the top left over here, we do have uh, Sanctuary up over there. Uh, the vault, oh, um, the vault 81 is right over here, by the way. So, I don't know, you might have found Chestnut Hillocks Reserve, uh, or, uh, Oberlin Station, because you do get these quests from the Miniman, which isn't too bad. I mean, it's on the western bit of sort of the, I don't know, this 
island of Boston. It probably has names or whatever, but then, you know, the bit that's cut off from this river, right? There's a vault 81 over there. Um, and yeah, to the north here, this is Charleston over here with, um, with Bunker Hill. And this is where you will find the USS Constitution, for example. Um, and then if you go over here, this is um, Cambridge, Cambridge, Harvard, all that over there. Again, you know, map spoilers, I did warn you about some things. Um, although, you, just because you see something on the map doesn't necessarily mean you can get there. Uh, what else? Concord, where's where's Lexington? I don't remember this anymore. Lexington is one of the first areas you start off with, isn't it? You go through it somewhere over here? Damn, I don't remember my, uh, my geography. But I think all the things I can sort of think about that are worth talking about in terms of um, Boston landmarks are probably listed. I mean, there's the airport. The airport is cool, right? The airport is very cool. Um, yeah, don't don't go over on this eastern tip of the map unless you are ready for some insane fights. Same thing with the south. Um, northwest is the lowest level. The further south and the further east you go, the higher level all the monsters get. So just be warned about the landscape there. In particular on the fringes. Like, Boston isn't quite as bad as up there. Up there is bad. I think that's probably it, Beantown Brewery, which is good. There's actually some great stuff over here at the Beantown Brewery. Uh, I don't know if you can just go there directly and do stuff, or you might have to pick up some quests in Good Neighbor first, and then go to the brewery. I guarantee you, you'll have a great time. So yeah, Vault 81, the USS Constitution, is good. The brewery is just a minor thing, but there's actually something really cool there that is definitely worth checking out. And I guess that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, folks. See you next time. Bye-bye.